Hey everybody, Dr. Doug Lucas here, retired orthopedic surgeon, now focusing my practice on longevity and bone health. Have you been recently diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia and you've been told to take calcium and vitamin D? Well, this is a very classic recommendation of supplementation for osteoporosis. And it's not wrong, but it leaves a lot of questions once you leave the doctor's office, you go home, and you start looking on the internet as to what you should buy, and there are so many options out there. My goal today is to help you get through that. So we're going to talk about the specific things that I recommend for our patients in optimal bone health, the specific calcium, the specific vitamin D, how you should test it, and then also what should come along with that supplement so that you're making sure that it's absorbed correctly. So stay tuned. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is vitamin D. So vitamin D can come in several different forms and we can also get this naturally. So let's talk about the natural way to get vitamin D first. So vitamin D is actually synthesized in your skin in response to UV sunlight from the sun. So if you are not going outside or if every time you are outside you are wearing clothes and covering your body with sunscreen or makeup with sunscreen in it, you are not gonna be making any natural form of vitamin D. Now, what's also interesting about vitamin D synthesis is that it really depends on what time of year, what time of day, and where you live. So there are a lot of factors that can really dictate how much vitamin D you can naturally make. This is why it's one of the vitamins that I recommend people testing, and you can test vitamin D, and I'll talk about that in a second. But when we talk about getting vitamin D through the sun, what I recommend people to do is to get sun exposure every day, in the morning and then in the evening. This is both good for vitamin D production, but also good for your circadian rhythm. Once you get that 15 to 20 minutes, that's probably all you need from a circadian rhythm perspective. Depending on where you live, that may be all you need from a vitamin D perspective too. However, most people aren't getting this. Most people when they're outside are covering themselves with sunscreen. And if you are doing that, you're not gonna get vitamin D that you need. And we test most people, and I can tell you that the vast majority of people, I think without exception, unless you're supplementing vitamin D, you're low in vitamin D. So when it comes to what type of vitamin D to supplement, we really wanna go with vitamin D3. So when you look on the back of a supplement, you should see it should say vitamin D3, or it might say as cholecalciferol. We'll spell that for you, cholecalciferol. So vitamin D3 is the active form of vitamin D. Vitamin D goes through a couple of different conversions in your body. This allows you to absorb and have the least amount of effort to actually make this vitamin D effective and you can absorb that vitamin D better if you take your vitamin D supplement with a fatty food or with food in general rather than on an empty stomach. So you might be asking yourself, well, how much vitamin D? Well, I can't give you those specific recommendations because it really depends on your starting point. It depends on how you absorb it. It depends on the function of your gut. It depends on vitamin K, which we'll talk about next, but it also depends on your genetics. So unless you're testing, it's really hard to know and vitamin D, you can overshoot. So you can have too much vitamin D. Now, generally, it's pretty hard to get there unless you're taking really big doses. And by big doses, I mean more than 5,000 IU or international units a day. If you're taking more than that, or even if you're taking that and you're susceptible, you could potentially get vitamin D levels of over 100. That potentially puts you at risk. So our recommendations, if you're not going to test, is to stay well clear of that 5,000 mark. Honestly, probably more like 2,000, maybe 3,000, but really you should be testing this one. Um, if you're testing, then you can push it as far as you need to. I have patients that are taking over 10,000 IU of vitamin D a day and their levels are perfect. But again, that is somebody who is testing. We know what their levels are and we're keeping them out of trouble when it comes to reading their labs. All right, the next one I wanna talk about is vitamin K. Now vitamin K, we used to not hear anything about it. It used to all just be about vitamin D. I think we're gonna start hearing more and more about vitamin K and vitamin D is gonna become just an accepted standard that most people are on it. Vitamin K has a significant impact, not only on how you absorb vitamin D, it also has an impact on how you absorb and utilize calcium, which we'll talk about, but it also has a direct impact on osteoblasts, the cells that make bone. So you can imagine, therefore, vitamin K is pretty darn important. 
Now, one of the challenges with vitamin K is that it comes in many different forms. So it used to be when you would look at a supplement for vitamin K, it would have vitamin K1 in it. And oftentimes it said, you know, vegan, plant-based, you know, vitamin K which is fine, except that your body can only utilize so much vitamin K because we have to convert vitamin K1 to vitamin K2, and we can really only convert so much of it at one time. So if you're getting a whole lot of K1, either through supplementation or through plants, you're really not gonna be able to convert that to vitamin K2 in any appreciable form. Now, vitamin K2, you can get it through food. It's found in some animal products. It's found in some cheese, mostly fermented forms of those things but really not in very high quantities. That's why this is such a good one to supplement. You wanna get vitamin K2 as, and write this down, M as in Mary, K7. So vitamin K2 as MK7. I know that's very confusing. The reason why that's important though is there are other forms out there, specifically MK4. So vitamin K2 is MK4, used to be the more common version. And there was some literature to support using vitamin K2 is MK4, but what we find is that the half-life, meaning how quickly your body absorbs and utilizes it, is relatively rapid for MK4 version of K2. So you need to use the MK7 version so that you have a longer half-life. You only have to take it potentially once a day. Some people take it twice a day, but it's better than having to take it four or more times a day as MK4. That really does need to come through supplementation. It's gonna be hard to get that one through food. Now, as far as how much vitamin K2, there's some debate on this. If you look at the literature, there are animal studies that have really big doses. Most of the human studies are relatively low. You'll see supplements kind of anywhere between 80 micrograms to 300 micrograms. Um, I prefer to go to the to higher doses. What I find is the products that are higher quality tend to have higher doses. So that goes to show these people are doing research, they're finding that they need these, these bigger doses to get the job done. So I would push between 200 and 300 micrograms of vitamin K2 is MK7. All right, now let's talk about the clotting risk. So there is some fear that if you take vitamin K, it's gonna interfere with your, what's called the coagulation process and clause blood clots. There are multiple animal studies, multiple human studies that show that that's absolutely not true unless you are on a drug that works through a specific pathway to help you from clotting your blood. So that specific drug is called Coumadin or Warfarin. If you are on that drug, you should not take vitamin K and you also need to watch how much of it you're getting through diet, specifically is K1. You need to talk to your doctor about this and figure out what's right for you. There are other drugs out there that can help you to probably achieve the same goals that you're on for Coumadin, but again, talk to your doctor about that. Those other drugs though, are not impacted by vitamin K consumption in supplemental form in the doses that I'm talking about. All right, thanks so much for your attention and congratulations on making it this far in this video. If you are enjoying this content, please like, subscribe, and sign up for notifications so you can learn when we post new content about osteoporosis and bone health. If you know anybody that would benefit from this information, please share this with them. The more people this is shared with, the more people that will experience this information and education. Lastly, if you wanna learn more about how we manage osteoporosis, about tips and tricks that you can learn and do on your own, please look in the description below, sign up for our masterclass where we go through all of these things. It takes about an hour, it's absolutely free. Please join us. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about is calcium. Now, this is the traditional, you gotta take calcium if you have osteoporosis. The truth is, is that if you look at the recommendations and the science behind how much calcium you need, you can get this through diet. Now the challenge is, is if you don't tolerate dairy, it gets relatively challenging to get it through diet. And then you also don't know how well you're absorbing it. So this is one of those things where we tend to hedge on, okay, let's add more calcium than potentially we need because we don't know how well we're absorbing it. And we know that we are trying to build bone. So we need to get as much calcium into the body as we can without having too much. And that's the balance. So how much calcium is enough? Well, the recommendations are between 1200 and 1500 milligrams of calcium for postmenopausal women. Now that doesn't mean that you need to take all of this through supplementation. Whatever you can get through food, please get through food. But then the leftover, I recommend to my patients to get through supplementation. That's generally around 600 milligrams a day. The next question then is what type of calcium? 
So if you look up different calciums, there are all kinds of different calciums on the market from a supplementation perspective. If you go to Costco or you go to you know, Amazon and you just type in calcium and you look for the cheapest one, you're gonna get what's called calcium carbonate. This is basically chalk, it's a rock. Your body does not absorb it. In, in very, very low percentages will it get absorbed. You also have to have a very well-functioning stomach to absorb really any calcium, but definitely calcium carbonate. So try to avoid calcium carbonate unless you absolutely can't afford anything better. So there are other forms of calcium out there. So some common ones might be calcium citrate, um, calcium gluconate, um, anything that says elemental calcium is talking about how much actual calcium is, is in whatever the form of calcium is. Calcium has to always be combined with something for your body to consume it. Therefore, you're gonna see it with all these different names out there. You can sort of read past that when it comes to your bones and just look for this calcium form that I really like called calcium hydroxyapatite. And if you look up calcium hydroxyapatite, you might find microcrystalline hydroxyapatite or MCHC. Now what I like about MCHC is it has stuff other than calcium. So it is calcium, it's a little bit of phosphorus, it's a little bit of other minerals in the ratio in which your body normally uses them, which is really important. It's collagen, it's growth factors, it's all these other proteins, again, that your body knows what to do with, it knows how to utilize, and it can help them to make bone. So MCHC is not just a calcium supplement, it's really a bone supplement. All right, so when you add MCHC, or microcrystalline calcium hydroxyapatite, to vitamin D3 with vitamin K2 as MK7, you're gonna get the basis of a well-rounded supplement protocol for osteoporosis. Again, I recommend that you test the vitamin D side of this. If you're not gonna test it, just bring your dose down to keep yourself safe. Obviously talk to your doctor about adding anything to make sure that these things are safe for you. But if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, this is a reasonable starting point. There are many things that you could potentially add and our supplement stack for our patients generally is gonna have somewhere between five, maybe even up to 10 different things, depending on what they're deficient in. But again, this is a reasonable starting point. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. I really hope you found that helpful. If you did, please like, subscribe to the channel and sign up for notifications so we can send you new information whenever it becomes available. If you know anybody that would benefit from this information, please share this with them. And if you want to learn more about how we manage osteoporosis, some tips and tricks on how you can do it yourself, please look in the description below and sign up for the masterclass. It's totally free. It takes about an hour and we'll be able to answer your questions about how we manage osteoporosis. Lastly, we want to hear from you. Please leave comments below. We will answer questions, respond to comments as they come in. If you have topics that you would like us to talk about, leave that as well. And we will put all these together and we will come up with new content as soon as we can on those topics. Thanks again for making it to the end of the video. I look forward to hearing stories about how this information helps you and about your journey in your bone health.